Terrific. What the hell was she doing there? Well, she lived there. I don't mean her. I mean you. What was she doing there? Hello to you too, Donald. Marge. Okay. How you doing, baby? I'm okay, Dad. All right, look, I don't want to get into this now. God knows you need time. But I sure would like to know what the hell you were doing shacking up with three other kids in the middle of the night, especially a lunatic delinquent like Lane. Welcome to Blood and Black Rum Podcast Halloween 2022 Special. This year we're craving some Cronenberg. We're bringing you Wes Craven and David Cronenberg movies all Halloween season from September to October 31st. Experience the visceral thrills with movies like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Rabbit, Last House on the Left, and more. Hey guys, welcome back to the Blood and Black Rum Podcast. I'm Ryan from Coldsploitation.com, and I'm joined with my co-host, Mark. How's it going? Yeah, we're doing pretty well, except I just noticed I have a fly in my beer. Which, that's annoying. But <laughs> other than it. that... Or, it, came, it came with it. Yeah, apparently. Other than that, I'm doing all right. I picked it out. We're good. Just to prove it, I'm sipping now. So, no, but um, we're doing really well. You know what? This is uh, the start of our Halloween fest. We always do a nice two-month celebration of the holiday, the, uh, the holiday of Samhain. I like to call it a fun romp. That's right. Uh, it's, it's always a good time for the Blood and Black Rum podcast. We do a lot of stuff. Um, we try to get like eight movies in. Um, if you followed us in the past, you know that we generally tend to do like a themed month. Uh, maybe the first year was like, kind of we didn't do some of that. We, we, we kinda, did like, not. Yeah, we, we kind of we were just getting into the swing of things. But after that, we did themed years. And we've done stuff like Saw series. We did all the Halloween movies. Um, Saw was our first theme for the holiday. Actually, you know what? If you go back to our original first take on Halloween, we um, did something different that we haven't done again, which was a, like, what kind of spooky films do you like to watch on Halloween? Yeah, it was a fun one. It's cool. And, and you know what, what I might do this year for, for to make it even a little bit different is, like, add... Uh, like spooky sound effects in the background, just like you know, throughout the episode, Sp- spooky th- sound effects, you know, to make it make it different, feel feel like a Halloween episode. So, um, think about that. That could get annoying too fast, you know, like <laughs> constant cackling and and stuff in the background. It might, it might get annoying, but we'll well, we've done. So- let's say we've done Saw. We did remake a Ween where we did a bunch of the remakes. Mm-hmm. Um, um, we've done. Um, Zombie movies. We did uh, a, a uh, uh, back from the, what was it? What we, uh, reanimated. I'm sorry, reanimated, yeah. which is basically zombie movies. <clears throat> we did all the Halloweens. Yep. Yeah, We had. I, you know what? I think I actually need to put the the first. I think we're missing the first Halloween for for whatever reason during a migration when we migrated from different hosts. I think we missed. I think we lost that episode. So I got to find it and I got to put it back up. <laughs> I think we're missing that one. Or we just do a new one. What if we did a new one and we we're just like. Here's our take on Halloween no. again. Well, hold on. It's not what if. It's you do it like Scott Stapp. <laughs> what if? What if? What if? What if? <laughs> what if we could change our opinions? That's like the modern. I say, you know, John Lennon's Imagine. Imagine there's mm-hmm. no half. That's Scott Stapp's version. <laughs> what if? What if? <laughs> yeah. No, I uh, I, I would enjoy that actually, like to to return to it. it. But surprisingly, you know what? We're you know we we did um, the Halloween series, and then we did John Carpenter movies for last year's uh, Halloween. So we, so creepy, it's Carpenter. That's right. We, and and in that scenario, we kind of we because we've done a lot of John Carpenter. We were like, let's. What if we took some of the best of John Carpenter and some of the worst of John Carpenter, and we pl- we put them together, and we we did them like all in one shot for Halloween. So yeah, that jokes, jokes on you. Didn't watch a single bad film that entire time. <laughs> so that was the that was last year's. Um this year we 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 thought we would con- continue to try to do like the um the themed idea of a director. But then also like change it up just a tad 
to give it you know a little bit of a difference from last time. Um, so instead of just picking one director here, we decided, and, and we still stuck with the alliteration for whatever reason. Um, it just well, kind of. As I say, to show how uh, creatively bankrupt you are, uh, we were originally just going to do David Cronenberg, and you're going to call it so creepy it's Cronenberg, which I was going to turn it into like a whole, uh, you know, a whole series of so creepy it's, cr- you know, <laughs> so creepy it's, cr- but uh, so creepy it's Kumar. Then we're going to do the the all the Harold and Kumar movies, uh, but no, <laughs> we, uh, we 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 change it up a little bit. We still pick, we picked Cronenberg, and you know what? It's kind of interesting too. Cronenberg had a new movie come out this year, Crimes of the Future, which technically is a movie that he's he he did Crimes of the Future. It was a movie that he did in the seventies, and then he did it again. Um, it, it's completely different. Doesn't make any difference. You know, like they're not related. I haven't seen it, the new one yet. Um, but we didn't pick that one for our for our month, um, so that's an interesting choice on on my end that I did not ch- choose to do that one. Instead, what we're doing is we're gonna do a like almost like a uh, dual director month. We're gonna do um, a focus on Cronenberg and then also on Craven, Wes Craven, and we're calling it Craven some Cronenberg. And I like that little play on words there. Nice alliteration. Yeah, I almost, and I thought about it, and I was like, do I want to do Craven, comma, some Cronenberg? And I was like, no, you know what? Because I think that takes away from the the pun of the 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 phrase. So I <sighs> didn't do that, and I did Craven, some Cronenberg. And, and I think that, that fits. You know, I like it. I I'm picked, proud of myself. I picked Craven, so you go, you're welcome. You did, yeah. So it works out, and we've done a few Wes Craven movies. Um, we've done New Nightmare uh, during our Wes Craven retrospective when he was uh, when he had just passed away. Um, we've done Scream, obviously, and we, we did the script. We did all the screams. We, we, that was another yes. one of our nice little blocks that we did. And I, th- I think that's it for Craven. Is that right? Is that all we've done? Pretty sure that's it. Mm. Um, which is surprising. I that, yeah, I think that is it. That's all we've tackled. So it was a perfect time to do Wes Craven movies. And we've done zero David... No, I'm sorry. We've no, done we did one David Cronenberg. The Fly. The fly. Um, for for, for <coughs> Jeff, Jeff Goldblum month. That's right. So it, it was a, a good time to do both of them. So I think we're going to have a good time with this. We're going to do them, um, you know, like one Craven, one Cronenberg, one Craven, one Cronenberg, and um, kind of alternate <laughs> from there. And we should have a really fun time. I don't know that we'll draw any comparisons between the two, but you know, it's fair game anyway. If we if we decide to, um, so I, I don't I don't think we're that good at film analysis. To bother yeah, to no, like I don't I don't know dude. if I'm gonna like, you know, say like, oh well, you know what? Looking at the director, uh, you know, the the direction that they they've taken, you know, very similar uh, directions. And actually, to be honest with you, not very similar directions at all. Um, but. Maybe we'll find some similarities there as we go through the, the uh, filmographies of both. So um, I'm not going to announce specifically on the show what we're covering. Um, you can take a look. I did post on uh, social media. Um, I did post like, uh, like a snippet of all of the things or most of the things that we're going to cover this month. Um, they're like really small little poster snippets on, on each uh, like seven different things that I posted. Um, so if you look closely, you can probably figure out what we're doing. But I'm not going to announce them until, you know, we do the next show. So it'll be a nice, fun surprise as you tune in and find out what we're doing. So hopefully you'll enjoy our Halloween episodes. Um, And for the first one that we have for the show, we're going to start out with a Wes Craven classic. And interestingly enough, we have never done this one, never talked about it really on the show. Besides when we did New Nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, which the remake. We, yeah, we kind of like skipped way ahead and did the the new stuff. But we're going to return to Wes Craven's, you know, big breakout slasher movie with A Nightmare on Elm Street. And you know what? I'm saying that, it, and I want you to continue to remember, don't just refer to it as Nightmare on Elm Street. It is very clearly a Nightmare on Elm Street. It's telling you, listen, this isn't the only fucking nightmare that's happening on Elm Street. There's there's bound to be seven or eight more of them that are going to be happening on Elm Street. So this is one of the nightmares Just, that are happening. So this is the man who forgot to put jo- a jo- John Carpenter's on every film. That's John why Car- I said that, because we're referring to it as a nightmare on Elm Street. You need that article. And what about, what about Anne? 
Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one for uh, for the uh, grammatically incorrect. <laughs> I tried putting the, an article in front, but I chose the wrong one yeah. to make it. <laughs> and Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> That's where uh, a school teacher with a giant yardstick shows up and is like, No! No, it's incorrect. It's the same one that says every time you said me and my friend, like, no, me went and died. <laughs> Thinking back to like elementary school, how gruesome that is. Every time you use me improperly, like, no, me went and died off a cliff. Like, whoa. What the fuck me ever did? Yeah. You're th- you're th- when you say and Nightmare on Elm Street, you're thinking of uh, Wes Craven's uh, stepbrother, Will Craven, who did <laughs> and Nightmare on Elm Street. The porn. <laughs> yeah, the porn. The porno one. Um, no, but uh, it is surprising that we've, you know, we've really never talked too much about A Nightmare on Elm Street. We've done, you know, we, we've done most of the other big films of the 80s, like the big the big slasher movies we've done. I Halloween, mean, we did Friday the 13th. But we haven't Silent, done A Nightmare on Elm Street. Silent Night, Deadly Night. Yeah, no, I said the April, big slash. <laughs> April, April Fool's, yeah. New Year's Evil. Like, listen. We skipped Mako. over A Nightmare on Elm Street for some reason. We were just... It didn't. Well, uh, to be honest with you, there's a lot of Wes's canon that you know we've kind of skipped over, which is you know, kind of. Like, oh, I mean, know. I guess we did probably talk about a Nightmare on Elm Street when we did the Wes Craven re- retrospective because we kind of ran through um, Wes Craven's output a little bit there and talked about some of our you know our favorites from his output, but um, I don't think we really went in depth with the movie. And you know, we normally devote an entire episode to movies, so. It was a perfect time to do a Nightmare on Elm Street, start things off really strong. And, um, you know what? I've seen this movie so many times now, I I can't even count. And it's kind of different from what we normally do on the show, where we try to pick some things that we really aren't familiar with. Um, For me, like, A Nightmare on Elm Street is a really big movie. I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen it on the TV versions. I used to own the, like, the DVD filmography of The Nightmare on Elm Street. Um... And I don't even remember, like, the first time I saw it. But I do know that I've always been kind of entranced with The Nightmare on Elm Street as a, as a concept. I think it's a really cool idea. I like that it came from, um, like, an actual event that, West Cra- that stuck out to Wes Craven about, you know, people dying when they were sleeping. Um, I think it's a, an overall really cool idea. How about you? How many, have you seen it a lot? Have you, you know, is this one of your, your big movies? Yeah, I've seen it, like, quite a few times. Um, it's definitely one that is a film that I could kind of, you know, see in my mind, you know, without ever really thinking about it. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that that's for me, too. Like, it's it's one of those movies where you're just, like, you don't really need to, like, think back and be like, hmm, I can't really remember what happened in it. It's one that I can, <clears throat> you know, pretty much recall throughout pretty, pretty well yeah, <laughs> yeah. Pretty well. i, I, I could have went into this film without you know without even watching it oh yeah yeah just definitely like, you know like oh, yeah, you know but yeah um it's definitely one that i've seen like you know i re- definitely re- do revisit over and over again kind of like you know like w- once every couple of years just sit down and kind of like all right you know let's watch nightmare on, a nightmare on elm street um We'll say off the bat, it's not my favorite Wes Craven film, mm-hmm. but it is definitely uh, culturally, culturally relevant. It's totally part of the zeitgeist, and in fact, um, I think last year, uh, Library of Congress uh, put it in the library to be pr- forever preserved. So, mm. Very nice. You don't have that too often with the horror genre. Yeah, in 2021, it was selected for preservation by the film registry, so... Very cool. Very cool. That says a lot, because... Yeah. Uh, and, and if you ever watch this film and compare it to, like, a lot of the films of that time and of that ilk, it does so much, like, Wes's, like, like attention to detail and subtle, like, subtle nuances throughout or what make the film outstanding compared to, like, con- a lot of the contemporaries. Like, if you were to compare this to, like, you know... Friday the 13th part 3 mm-hmm. you know it's a lot more subtle but a lot more nuanced at the same time 
Yeah, and that's actually an important, or like a good thing to point out too, is A Nightmare on Elm Street actually came um, a little bit later on in the slasher craze because at, at in 1984 when it did release, we had already gotten quite a bit of slasher movies, including sequels to um, some of the big ones, like you know Halloween had already had its sequels out, um, and Friday the 13th had already had it, some sequels out. So, A Nightmare on Elm Street, we kind of think of contemporaneously with Halloween and Friday the 13th, but it really isn't. It actually came a little bit later, and from that, you would probably think, oh, well, it was of the ilk of the same type of ideas that, you know, the slasher genre had after Halloween and Friday the 13th released, which was to take a holiday or event, a specific event, and then make a slasher film revolving around it. And that's really not the case with A Nightmare on Elm Street, which I think makes it so refreshing in the genre um, that we don't get like a, an overall co- copy-paste job of what a slasher movie would be. Um, this one is extremely unique. You know, the, the whole dream scenario is a, a really big difference of a slasher movie. Generally, we, when we think about slasher movies, they're pretty... Um, slated in reality you know it's it's more so like kids go somewhere there's a killer there and they are murdered um that you know when you think about that that's you know there's not really anything to it that's too out of the ordinary you know murders happen um and a slasher doesn't really seem to be outside of the realm of possibility but in a nightmare on elm street it does take fantastical elements and then meld them with a slasher uh Genre, So I think that, you know, if you had come into Nightmare on Elm Street not really knowing um, the slasher history, then you might think, oh, you know, a a derivation of the rest of the slasher genre because it really fits the time period. But it's really not. And I think that's what sets Wes Craven apart as a director a lot of the time um, is that, you know, his movies do tend to come in at uh, portions of the horror genre where, you know, things are kind of like in the midst or or even waning, um, like w- with Scream, and then he kind of revitalizes them. And I think he did the same thing with Nightmare on Elm Street. And uh, I think we'll talk about that probably a little bit more as we get into the show. But let's take a break real quick and talk about the beer that we have on the show today. Um, it's not, you know what we generally during our Halloween episodes we try to theme it around Halloween type things or Oktoberfests or you know things that that are part of the fall well we didn't do that this time (laughs) this time i kind of uh was not really able to find something um specifically fall like and that's probably because we are still at the tail end of summer a lot of places still are not getting a lot of oktoberfest things or things that we have at least things that we haven't had before on the show and as we try to do that too we try not to really repeat things that we've had so well it wouldn't be great if every year all right Got the same same Oktoberfest. Genesee Oktoberfest. How's it taste, Ryan? Mm -hmm. Tastes like Genesee Oktoberfest. Delightful. This week we have Saranac Oktoberfest. How's Saranac Oktoberfest? Delightful. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. We try. We try not to do that. So, you know, it it does end up getting a little bit harder over time when you're searching for like, hey, what's something new that fits the theme that is also, you know, something we haven't had on the show. It's difficult sometimes, but I went with something that I thought was at least somewhat themed to the idea of fall, something that I don't really think of as a like particularly summer type beer, and um, one that had just released, and also one that we do, you know, a brewery that we do quite a bit on the show, and we've, in the most recent past, we've I think we've had pretty much every new release that they've put out so far. Um, so it just was right to pick this one for the, for the first part of the show. And I promise we'll get into like more Oktoberfest style beers and, and Halloween themed beers later on. But right now, what we've got on the show is a new one from Amagang Brewery, which, uh, if you've listened before, you, we've covered a multitude of times. How fucking dare you? Yeah. <laughs> it's Brewery Amagang. Sorry. I, I, I call it Amagang oh, Brewery. Yeah. I, I just refer to it as Amagang, really. Yeah, I think everyone does. Yeah. I, I do forget, like, like oh, it's Brewery Amagang. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they just released their 25-year anniversary ale, the 25th anniversary ale, um, which makes a lot of sense that it is a variant of their 
most one of their most popular beers that they've ever brewed, the Rare Voss. Um, the 25th anniversary ale is like taking the Rare Voss and then kind of making it stronger, giving it a little bit more of a flavor profile, uh, making it into an Imperial. So this 25th anniversary ale is basically a rare, an, an Imperial rare, rare Voss uh, with orange peel, <clears throat> grains of paradise, and coriander. I was say which if you guys yeah, say if you don't know what the rear boss is from uh Alma Gang, it's an am- it's a Belgian amber ale. Has as Ryan said, the grains of paradise, orange peel, the coriander. Um giving it a pretty distinctive Belgian flavor to it. D- it's one of a delightful, um, the amazing beers. It's one of the beers that really got me into Belgian styles as a whole. Um it's well balanced, it's malty, it's crisp, it's dry, you can get it down you get all that nice like you know belgian like banana clove flavor and with this beer though they don't say it's basically kind of like an imperial version of the rare boss that's pretty it much yeah <laughs> it's essentially what it is because it is like an imperial amber ale with all those characteristics so um with that being said um i like this a lot i think it's very good um i think the heightened alcohol, and I think, what is it, 8.9, 9%, yeah, 9%. Yeah, it's basically 9, yep. So I think that 9% alcohol, it definitely adds a new characteristic to it. I think the alcohol, which I'm not a big fan of, like, when, it's one of the reasons why I don't like Imperials that much, because the alcohol is always, it's always a gamble on what you're going to get out of it, mm-hmm. if it adds to the beer or takes away from it. Though it does add, like, a definitely you get like an alcohol hit to it i do think it pairs well enough with the orange peel and the coriander to make it a little bit more medicinal but not in a bad way like it makes you know pairs with it nice and it makes the bready maltiness of the uh the, blah, 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 the shit the malt they use in the beer I think it does add like a nice quality to it that makes it more, you know, biscuity and a little bit more warm. Something that you could take the rare Voss, which is a great year-round beer, but I would say something that, like summer and fall, spring, I think it just winterizes it and is incredibly enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Um, not as I would not say I like it as much as the rare Voss. It's been a while since I've had it. Uh, it's still very delightful. I like this a lot. Yeah, I think it's really good as well. Uh, it's been a long time since I've had a Rare Voss. I do really like Rare Voss, and um, I, I pretty much like every Amagang beer that I've had. And actually, um, back in the day when I was f- you know first starting to drink beers is when I really had a lot of the Amagang output, like the, the very it's traditional one, Belgians that they put out. As I say, that back in the day, as I say, back in the day when you used to be able to afford the six-packs, they sold them in the big 24-ounce champagne bottles mm-hmm. and, with the cork, and we buy one you know we chip our money together buy one of those take it home but oh it's, it's delightful you know? yeah that's a decade ago now and uh-huh. i don't think they even sell those champagne bottles anymore mm, yeah i don't know i don't really see them too often but like uh, back in the day like i used to not i guess i probably appreciate the the belgian styles as much as i do now like especially some of the quads and things like that that really stood out to me um as being like kind of off-putting in that I wasn't really used to their flavor. And now I really like pretty much every single beer that I you can think of besides like the odd ones, pumpkin beers and stuff like that. Uh, squash beers I'm not really a huge fan of. But other than that, I pretty much like every style. And um, I'm a really big fan of Belgians and uh, farmhouse ales and things like that. And I've really come around to, you know, the flavors of amber ales and, and stuff like that. Um, and I think if I would, would return to Rare Voss, I would really, really love it. Um, I think it's a really good beer from what I've tried, but I just don't remember it too clearly. With the 25th anniversary ale, I think this is a really, really solid beer. Um, I am not super opposed to the high alcohol content of it. Um, I think that it does add like a, a nice... Um, strong flavor profile to it but it doesn't really become overpowering or overbearing um and then i think that we do really get a nice bit of like belgian orange peel flavor to it um the nice coriander element of spice and you know all of those pair really well together to make a nice strong beer that is very drinkable 
um, even at its 9% alcohol content. Um, so I'm really curious now to, to go back and try Rear Voss and see what are the main differences that I get between you, that one and this one. You'll feel like we're back in 2015. We're yeah. seeing fucking yeah. Primus and Dinosaur. Yeah, yeah really? Um, yeah. But, but like, other than that, I mean, I think this is really cool. I like that they've taken, like, you know, their normal, their their big beer, the thing that really kind of put them on the map. Rear Voss is, has always been, like, a standout for them. Even the Belgian Pale Ale, which they used to do quite a bit. And was a really big favorite of both of us. Seen, that, that's gone now, like but Rare Voss is still there. <laughs> you know, they've kept that one around. And it's cool to see them return to that and, like, kind of revitalize the recipe a little bit and try something else with that specific style to kind of um, commemorate their 25 years of being in, in business. And if you think about it, um, let's see, 25 years, I'm 31 now. So they've been, they've been they're 33, 31. I would say 30, 31. I'm 33 Jesus now. Jesus Christ. So they've been in business for almost you know the how long i've been alive and i i like to think that i've been around there for quite a long time but they've obviously been you know brewing for quite a while so um props to them for making 25 years it's awesome yeah and like uh ryan was saying earlier one of the reasons why we basically anytime i'm getting does really something new um even though, like, a lot of their new stuff is kind of straying away from, like, the traditional Belgian style, uh, we always pick it up because it's one of the first breweries that we can think of that, like, we started out on uh, in our craft beer journey. And it's one of the few that has maintained its quality throughout. You know, as much as we love it, like, like Saranac and Sam Adams, Saranac and Sam Adams' quality over the past decade... 15 years has dropped precipitously mm-hmm. you know sam's keeps tinkering with the fucking oktoberfest every year until you're like hey you know what i'm not gonna bother anymore you know so mm-hmm. it's nice to see that you know they consistently are putting out quality belgian beers yeah, yeah. and Definitely. the fact that they're settled in the greatest town in all the world cooperstown new york is also another delightful thing go to the baseball hall of fame Pick yourself up a nice Tim Raines jersey. Mm-hmm. Expos. See some history. There you go. If you're not a Yankee fan, get mad because there's a bunch of Yankee paraphernalia in there because they're good. We'll have to do that again someday soon. Go to go back to uh, Cooperstown. Get stuck in the rain for a while. Yeah, Head that's for Will. The... That's when we went to see Wilco. Yeah. And you know what? It's one of the best times. Not not one of the best, sh- only the best shows I've ever been to. Which I had that downloaded the actual show because Wilco was kind enough because they actually record a lot of their live recordings. That was actually one of the shows that they put on to like their shop for you to download. So I have that night when we went to see them live on my iTunes still to this day. But that was also one of the best times at the Baseball Hall of Fame too. So and I try to go there every year because I love baseball and. Cooperstown is just a nice, stupidly nice town. Tourist trap, but a stupidly nice town. Mm-hmm. And even if you don't like baseball, I'd say it's like go to the Baseball Hall of Fame. It's one of the best museums going. It's cool to check out. Yeah. It's really well done. You know, sometimes like the Hall of Fames, they're kind of like small, you know. I know. We had a wrestling Hall of Fame in Amsterdam for a little while, and then they moved down to Texas because it was just like a glass shop. Mm-hmm. We got the Boxing Hall of Fame in Hartwick. It's Hartwick, right? I think it's got it. Somewhere down there. Yep. Um, but it's really nice. Not only that, I actually, you know, in all these years, I still haven't made a trip down to Almagang for an actual, like, tour of the brewery. Mm-hmm. Been there for a bunch of shows, which their concerts are great, too. Uh, it's like a little, if you were from New York, it's like a little Saratoga Springs, you know, SPAC. But... Smaller venue, and you get their beer for five dollars on like tap. So like you know you can't you can't yeah you yeah, can't I, bitch in I would like to go down there just to check out the brewery again. Um, you know, get stuff on tap instead of you know like not not go to the actual concert, but just check out the brewery. It's a nice place, really nice uh, fields, very you know beautiful. It's out in the out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I, I, I think last time we went, you still in twenty like eighteen, twenty nineteen. You still couldn't get any cell service out there. Be, so be pretty cool to check it out in the fall. I'm sure they get some really nice foliage there. So <clears throat> yeah, check just it gotta out. Ho- just got a whole Primus place there again. Yeah, celebrate their twenty fifth anniversary. Very very uh very cool milestone for them. So glad to be a part of it. All right, let's talk about 
A Nightmare on Elm Street, which is not 25 years old, is uh, much older than that. It's actually, So I'm 33 right now. I was born in 1989, so it's it's five years older than me. So it's almost, it's it's nearing its 40th anniversary. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Doesn't it make you feel old? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I was watching a uh, an extra on another movie that was released in 1989, and the guy was like, geez, yeah, this movie's almost 40 years old. I'm like, fuck, no, it's not. <laughs> that would mean I'm almost 40 years old, and I don't consider myself almost 40 years old. I like doing that to a friend, or like just driving in a car, and you hear like REMs, like uh, shiny, happy people. I'm like, you know... Uh, that album came out in 91, so it's 30 fucking years old. And you'd be like, shut your horn. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, I mean, so th- this movie is, is almost 40 years old, but it really stands up to time. I, I, I think that, like, even if you, you return to it, or even, like, let's say, like, a, you're a new viewer and you haven't seen it before. I really do think that even new viewers who are, like, kind of accustomed to, uh, <coughs> to you know, the... Excuse me the um the new stuff new new films new slashers blumhouse stuff i do think that if they go back and watch a nightmare on elm street it will really still hold up for them and still are you sure i think so are you sure because i think the, the new texas chainsaw massacre would put this film to shame <laughs> I, yeah really <laughs> sorry i had to think about that for a second it kind of stalled my brain out <laughs> Literally, the only thing I remember about that Texas Chainsaw Massacre film is the neon colors and the that bitch getting cold rolled on her, and be like, "Yeah, fuck her! <laughs> that guy's rolling coal! Woo woo!" And a redneck coming out. State fair's coming up. Yeah, We've got you know some tractor pulls going on. Let's go. But <laughs> I, I, I think that it would hold up. I think that they would honestly still see the merit in the movie and would still um see like you know why it is a revered movie because of the you know the the usage of the dreamscape as a means of doing a slasher movie because i think that's really the the ultimate appeal of nightmare a nightmare on elm street that you have this um this slasher villain but he's really not in the main world. He's not a, a normal human being, um, even though, like, after some of the sequels, we kind of get the same idea for Michael Myers and uh, Jason and stuff like that. They're not technically, like, real humans. They, they have, like, a mystical power. But at least in their initial openings, they, were, they seemed like real people that were just doing this murder. Um, and it, obviously Jason not in the first Friday. But uh, in, in Nightmare on Elm Street, it, it immediately puts you into a different reality. You are experiencing a supernatural killer. You're experiencing um, a guy that doesn't necessarily adhere to the rules of a slasher film that you, you must see from their point of view. You must see um, a very like serious and slow stalking uh, nature from them. Instead, Freddy kind of changes things up a little bit in this in, in Nightmare on Elm Street. He's you know he's not the Freddy of the sequels, of course. He's not like extremely hammy, but he doesn't have a particularly serious nature either. He likes to play with his victims, and I think that makes a Nightmare on Elm Street a really interesting movie because it does open up so many avenues of what you can do with killings. Besides the fact that like you just have a guy with a knife, like that gets boring fast. Um, what do you think about the idea of Freddy being like a, a person that comes from dreams? What does that open up for you as a viewer when you're, you're watching this movie? It, it's a great way to make the implausible plausible. Mm-hmm. Um, because too often we see stupid shit in slasher films, especially the further you get down the lines. Like I think of the Friday the 13th where Jason takes the girl and sleeping bag and just grabs her and starts whipping her against the fucking tree where you're like all right that's you know that's dumb it's funny i'm laughing but it's dumb kind of takes you out uh the dream you know having dreams and the supernatural already be tied to this killer makes it you know anything happen that much more believable and you can buy into it because that's part Mm. of the premise 
Yeah. It's part of the hook. And I think it so, also, not to, to interrupt, but I think no, it fine. also, like, the the idea of a dream, too, excuses a lot of what you're seeing on the screen, too. Because there, in A Nightmare on Elm Street, truthfully, when you relate it to real life, you could say, oh, no one would react like that. Um, there's a scene later on in the movie where uh, Nancy has had her father come in, who played by the inestimable John Saxon of course uh but he's come into the house and they've just seen their her her mother nancy's mother and john saxon's ex-wife sucked into the bed right like just you know skeletonized sucked into a bed like strobe lights happening like it's a fucking you know horror rave and they kind of are like oh wow that was weird and then nancy says like hey dad can you leave and my wife pointed out because she was watching too she was like no one would do that no one would just see their ex-wife sucked into a bed and just be like yeah okay let me just go well, downstairs I think, I think so I think with that though because it teases a lot about like especially the dream world you get that death so am I in a dream and I, mm-hmm. am I not mm-hmm. in a dream uh, so especially back then I think you kind of get away with it because we've seen what's going on in the dreams and what you know is happening in real right. life you can be tricked by it now because we've seen a whole bunch of, you know, kind of meta films and stuff. You kind of get by now, by, you know, 2022 standards, like, yeah, this is all happening in a dream. But, you know, for 1984, that's incredibly brilliant. You know, that kind of level of meta-ness, which, you know, is no wonder why Wes would later do New Nightmare and then the Scream films. Right, and I, I mean, I think you're right. I think... It does bring up the the point that like, hey, these the, these are dream scenarios, and even like at the end of the movie, the Wes Craven off, often makes us wonder like, are we in the dream scenario? Are we in reality? Was she successfully able to pull Freddy out of the dream? And in that moment, you really don't know. And I I think that that works really well for Nightmare on Elm Street because there are often times where we seamlessly transition between reality and dreamscape and we as a viewer and right there with the with you know the character we don't know which one we're in and i think that works really well for a nightmare on elm street that maybe you know in the later sequels didn't translate as well but here super creative in the ways that they uh transition into the dream element which i i again i i agree to i think i think the fact that you know west was you know English professor, for God's sakes, you know, he's able to have, <clears throat> excuse me, have that level of nuance in his writing, which is, you know, always present in a lot of his films. Because there's a lot of points in the film, like, by the end of the film, you could take, like, you could almost take, if you wanted to, I'm not saying it's accurate, but you could almost take by the end of the film, like, so was everything that we watched a dream being manipulated by Freddy? You know, this whole experience was was Nancy dreaming the whole time and being manipulated by Freddy? Was she, dr- you know, drifting in and out? Who knows? Because it's got that layer, you know, that level of subtext going on throughout it. Yep. And I think that, you know, makes it incredibly fun. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a really fun. And like, like I said, you know, you don't normally get this level of playfulness with a slasher movie. Uh, you don't get this level of creativity. I mean, obviously, Friday the 13th later on started to go for full on violence and try to find ways for Jason to just have more and more creative kills that kind of like spiraled out of control. But in A Nightmare on Elm Hall- Street. Halloween added satanic gimmicks and children and Donald Pleasance just yelling no over and over again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no. Here though, like you can you can have that. Like the the first scene is a perfect example of like you know you, you're in a dream. Dreams have weird elements to them that you just really can't explain, but they just happen, and you you get really nice um, layers to those dreams. Um, one of the great moments in A Nightmare on Elm Street is when Nancy is like in class and. You get Lynn Shea, you know, Bob Shea's daughter, just ever pointing out. Everybody knows there's some nepotism going on here at, <laughs> at New Line. Uh, but uh, there, she's in class, and they're, you know, they're obviously talking. They, they, here's uh, Wes's uh, English professor credentials coming in as well because they're talking about, like, Hamlet and stuff. 
So she's basically, you know, she's like in a, a dream state, but we don't really know that. We're just seeing her in her classroom. And she turns to the the door the, uh, the that leads out of the classroom. And she sees her friend Tina, who has been uh, viciously murdered um, earlier in the movie. And she, Tina's like in a body bag. And it almost has, it, the, it almost has like a look of like it's a religious figure, almost like a nun at first. Like when you see the, the body bag, which I kind of like about the whole element of religion in this movie, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But but that scene itself, where you see the body bag with Tina, she's kind of she's dead, and Nancy sees her get dragged away. It's a great moment because you have that sort of like dreamlike state where you're like, well, is Nancy just having a really bad dream because she just experienced like an incredible trauma in her life, or is it truly something supernatural going on? Uh, I I like that at the beginning of the movie, we really don't know. You know, especially if you were going in not knowing about Freddy at all. Uh, of course, now people are going to go into this movie and they're going to know all about the, the, the franchise and Freddy has become like a figure unto himself. But at the time, when you were, if you think about people first seeing A Nightmare on Elm Street, I think the supernatural element is kind of like downplayed at the beginning of this movie. I would agree. And then I think, if anything, it's not Freddy Krueger. He's Fred Krueger. Fred Krueger. Yeah, they do often refer you're, to him as Fred Krueger, yeah. Your your doorman, Fred Krueger. Your local mechanic, Fred Krueger. Yeah. Attorney at law, Fred Krueger. Can you imagine an attorney showing up in the courtroom with Fred Krueger's attire on? <laughs> with his striped sweater? It's, <laughs> Laughed it's out of it, court. It's just, it's just funny because it's just like you think about it, like... From the second film on, they're like, Freddy, Freddy, Freddy. Here, like, Fred Krueger. Fred Krueger. Krueger! It is kind of interesting because this film doesn't really, um, it doesn't actually have that much Fred Krueger in it, to be honest with you. Like, he's not uh, around that often. He shows up sporadically. I was say, he kills three people, too. Yeah, it's, so for, it's a, for, for a slasher film, the body count's incredibly low. Yeah, but it, like he doesn't really show up um, as like a, a specific character on screen. Like he he does appear a, a, occasionally um, in dreams, but he's not like a central figure like he would become in the later movies, especially like after um, two. You know, in three, he's a very big central figure and becomes like sort of like a. Uh, hackneyed version of himself um, in those movies with one-liners and stuff like that. But in how the, dare you? Well, First off, how dare you call anything New Line has ever put out hackneyed? Hmm? Well, <laughs> <laughs> a spade, a spade. Uh, how? <laughs> uh, but but I mean, like in this movie though, he really doesn't have much screen time and. Particularly, this is not a film where Robert Englund um, defined the Freddy Krueger persona. So it is interesting that they refer to him here as Fred Krueger because it's it's almost like they don't want to make him friendly to the audience. So, you know, you give him a name like Freddy. It's like, oh, my buddy Freddy over there. Um, yeah, he raped and murdered some kids, but yeah, he's a, overall a good guy, right? He's a nice guy. He's he donates guy. to the uh, community uh uh, buffet every now and then. So every you know. th- every Thanksgiving, he's down at the VFA yeah, serving he, those. He's serving it out. I I, I mean I kind of like that though because like with Nancy saying his name and like that the the one um, syllable name of Fred Fred it's very very like violent how she says it Fred Krueger, and I think that works really well. You know, it, it, you add Freddy later on, it's colloquial. It you, you feel like you're too familiar with him. So it's, it is. We're bonds. We're pals. Fred Kru- Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, what do you think about the uh, the first killing with Tina? Um, who you know she's in bed with Rod. Who you know, Hot Rod. What a I call what a name for Rod, man. He's I like call, he's that's the, what I call. Let's say that's what I call him. Hot Rod. How can the sex be bad when his name is Rod and you're you're yeah. yelling out, Oh Rod, Oh Rod. Not only that, it's missionary, so you know it's the best. Like just like you know, there ain't ex- no uh, Cialis or Viagra there. He's got a rod. Yeah, he does. And uh, like I said, it's all missionary. There's no we, no dogging or anything. He finishes on top, so like that's it's right. all stroke game there. But, <laughs> um but, 
What do you What do you think about that? Because that's that's that it's, initial it's, scene is where we really get the the uh, first kill. Uh, yeah, the first kill and the first identifying element of like this is supernatural because you know it's it you don't see a killer there. It's very well done. Um, I think it still holds up today. I think again, and it's not just us, but. A common theme in horror films, especially in analysis, always is less is more. And we get that because as we get to see her kind of dreaming, it sequences out of her actual dream to Rod witnessing what's happening to her. And it's not incredibly over the top violent, but it's her writhing about. Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, Bert, but <laughs> her, like, writhing about in agony her throwing herself and then as we get to see it she's literally throwing herself up against the wall flying around back and forth exorcist like get to see the actual like you know like stab like you know the stab wounds but we don't see the stabbing just see them like kind of happen like you know to her and then with like the blood shooting out and all that it's great it's really good and it's really effective and really creative getting to watch her, you know, kind of get ragdolled around until she eventually lands in the bed and the room's just covered in blood. And it really, it's awesome. It's really good. I and like, too, well, like, very the, effective. we see, like, from Rod's perspective, too, because it's very helpless. Like, you just see her being pulled up into the ceiling. Like, what are you going to do? <laughs> what can you possibly do to combat that? Like, oh, sorry, Tina, but uh, you're kind of out of reach here. Let me go get a ladder real quick. Um, but I, I like that a lot. I think it like it really presents the first creative elements to a Nightmare on Elm Street that we would get later on. Um, I think Wes is really on his game here in terms of suspenseful elements, in terms of um, the amount of uh, scares that he's able to produce because the film does not really rely too often on jump scares a couple times. Um, but it's more so relying on the heavy atmosphere of being in the boiler room area, of being in, like, moody dreamscapes. And I think it does a really good job with that, and Wes Craven really runs with those elements. And then also has a lot of creativity here to uh, explore things that we don't really see in slasher movies. Um, because we're in dreamscapes, we get stuff like the marshmallow stairs. You know, Nancy running up stairs that are, you know, filled with... <laughs> A fluffer nutter and uh you we get those elements or or freddy like coming through a wall and you know just his whole physique sticking out over the wall knocking over a cross that's over uh nancy's bed those are all really great elements that i think have stuck with viewers over the years whereas if you think about something like um uh like friday the 13th like Think back to Friday the 13th. What set pieces do you really remember from Friday the 13th, like, outright? There's only a couple. You know, you remember the drowning. You remember at the end of the movie where Jason comes up from the canoe, you know. But you You don't... You remember uh, Kevin Spacey's penis? Kevin Spacey. uh... (laughs) Kevin Spacey. No, (laughs) Kevin Bacon. You remember Kevin Bacon's ass. No, no, his penis. Kevin Bacon's bacon. I was saying, his penis, he comes flopping out when he goes jumping into the <laughs> yeah. water. We covered that on the show. Yeah. But <laughs> but you don't really remember too many other set pieces from Friday the 13th. But I would argue that you know Nightmare on Elm Street has a lot of set pieces, a lot of elements that you remember specifically because they are so creative to the, to the genre. And I think that that's really one of Wes Craven's biggest uh, ad- additions to the slasher element is that it got... It allowed this this slasher film to become a little bit more supernatural, a little bit um, outside of reality. And then we would start to get that with other films too, like Bad Dreams. Um, that was pretty much like a you know a co- kind of a copy of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Things that would get a little bit more supernatural and not rely on a very specific element of a killer and some teens as a slasher movie. Um, so I think that's really, you know, a, a great addition. Let's talk about Johnny Depp, who is a main character in this movie and who has notably, I think, been absent from discussions about his uh, 
you know, his 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 portrayal of Glenn in this movie. He doesn't his really poor, like to talk about his, it. His poor cloth, uh, clothing choice. You know, like wearing. Sh- I don't know, man. Cut I honestly mid-riff. wish that I was comfortable enough to wear a like half football shirt. It looks like it would be like a fun, comfortable thing to wear to bed. Listen, I just it's, a, it's okay because by today's standards, after eating those burgers that he's probably eating, you got a gun. He can't pull it. You're saying you can't pull it off now. I'm saying most people couldn't because it's the '80s. Like again, why is America so fat? It's not because we all of a sudden changed diet. It's it's the shit that we eat that's always yeah. been filled with shit that's you know keeping us fat. So like now it's like he he'd be comic book guy walking around like neat. <laughs> I honestly love um, Glenn and how inept he is at like doing like the one thing that he needs to do. Because there's like two for, times, for, for, no, for like four different times. Yeah. Like he- Heather uh, Lingkamp's like, just do this, and he's like, okay, and then he just falls asleep. Like the man <laughs> has a, uh, narcolepsy. narcolepsy. <laughs> he just falls asleep for no reason all the time. He's like got literally listening to his record player and headphones and watching and, a like the the TV that has bugles blaring on it. And he still falls that. asleep. And his parents are up still. I was like, it? It's like 10 it's o'clock. A, no, it's midnight. It's midnight. <laughs> his parents are still walking around like newspaper in hand. Like when they're she like calls outside, up and they're like, tea. they're like, it's midnight. Like, what What are you doing calling it midnight? It's like, bitch, go to bed. Like, you know, and then these assholes, like, 1980 solution to someone calling you late at night and you don't want to deal with it. Just leave the f- uh, phone off the receiver. Now, kids, if you don't know, a receiver... Is what you place your phone on to keep, you know, keep it housed. But if you Receiver. don't, it's busy. It, it always yeah, it's busy. It winds up you know, sounding busy. It's like you're, it's like you're on the phone, so it's gonna give the other person a busy signal. God, but I mean, like, yeah, that that part's great though. Just like because it's so fucking stupid. It's midnight, and they're like. Oh. It's midnight. What are they doing calling? It's like you're fucking wandering around with a new you're, – you're, you're not even like pajamas or anything. Like like you're being woken up by this like phone call. The guy's in a suit and he's outside looking at Nancy's house with the it's bars like, on it. And he's like, say, you know what? Ooh. I don't want Glenn hanging out with that girl anymore. Low rent fucking John Candy. I, I love around. him because he's such an asshole too. He's like, these kids just need a kick in the pants. Oh, let me talk to him. <laughs> He's asleep, but psh, they just need that. They I love just that need guy. That. I love that guy. It's great. Listen, I just got done doing Hands Across America, all right? I don't have time for this shit. Well, you know, obviously in A Nightmare on Elm Street, none of the parents on Elm Street are right in the head, right? They all have some sort of PTSD because they all banded together and they burned Fred Krueger to death. And so, I, I mean, I guess maybe we have to consider the fact when, that none of them are First off, are, are I would okay. say, for, first off... Who is being arrested for, like, 20 chi- child <laughs> murders and molestations? And they're like, he got away. <laughs> Technicality. Someone didn't sign the warrant. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. They're <laughs> like, oh, they, they searched his house, and they shouldn't have. So I is guess that we why have John, no other evidence. <laughs> I was say, is that why John Saxon's such a bastard in this? Like, I forgot to sign that fucking warrant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But like you know, like like it's it, that's dumb. That, that that doesn't like that doesn't happen. In spite of what people think, like if you've been accused of like twenty murders, great. One search warrant that didn't get signed isn't like unless like your plan is like he's got the Jeepers Creepers like pit of like bodies. That's not gonna be like the, the linchpin to that case. Like, uh oh, this one warrant wasn't signed, so he's got to he's got to go on all of them. Well, I guess I guess whatever happened, you know. Where's where where's Hangem High McCoy to, from Law and Order to put him in this place? Mm. That's I what mean, this that's what this movie needs. Sam Waterston is Ham Hangem High McCoy to fucking put everyone in their place. What I like too about this is that like no one was like we should probably just move away after this. They were all <laughs> like, let's live on the same street. Let's all live on. We we all killed Fred Krueger. Let's just live on the same street and just re, like you know have 
annual barbecues remembering that we just killed this guy. I'm, you know what I'm also going to do? I'm going to keep the knives that he used to, to murder all those kids. In, 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 in our furnace. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess, like, I, maybe this is sort of like a PTSD thing, but I do, I do love the fact that, like, every, no one moved away. Everyone is just like, ah. Is that why John Saxon's such a miserable shit in this film? Maybe. And that's why I mean, they had to get divorced. I There's a whole movie waiting to just just uh, divulge the the relationship between you know Lieutenant Thompson and his wife because it doesn't really go into too much detail. And I do like the fact that the film really um, kind of surprises the viewer with the fact that John Saxon is Nancy's father because like it brings you to the police station she's there you're thinking oh yep she's getting interviewed like they're wondering what the fuck happened with tina and then all of a sudden she's like dad i i do like that because it like and then it it kind of like throws into um this is reagan's america we don't have fucking divorces okay that happened during the carter administration when things are going sorry they are just separated right now he's not living at home he's living at the police station he's an important lieutenant god damn it yeah, the other thing that I, I I like about John Saxon being in this movie, besides the fact, like, I do think that Wes Craven used him too little in this movie. Not only, that, jo- time. Not only that, John Saxon is uncharacter... Like, one of the downfalls of this film is he's uncharacteristically uncharismatic in this. That is true. He He's just a douchebag. Not only that, but, like, he... You know, like, the, the way that he comes off, too, is, like, he's he's such an aloof dad, too. He's, like... You know, why are you letting her do these things? But, like, I'm here at the police station all the time. Like, I have zero interaction with Nancy besides the fact that she got brought into the police station. Other than that, Mar- you know, wh- why aren't you managing our daughter right now? Um, why did you let her to go to this, you know, p- place with a th- another uh, couple and boys? Um, I do like how Thompson is just a really, like, a, a really poor father figure. And doesn't listen to Nancy. Part of the reason why Nancy ends up the way she does at the end of the movie is because she asks John Saxon, "Hey, please come over in twenty minutes, like because I, I'm gonna bring this the killer to you." And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, yeah, whatever, Nancy. Uh, sure, yeah, I'll do that. I'm really fucking busy right now. There's listen, a kid dripping through the ceiling. Listen, you can't deal with that. Your your vagina is bleeding. The Kids stripping from the ceiling. You can't be dealing with this kind of nonsense. Right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Men, men are men are talking here. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is definitely an asshole figure uh, throughout the movie. But I, you still love John Saxon. You still. It's definitely. As like I think that, it's, it, he's the same character from Black Christmas. Is is Black? It's no, it's the same I person. No, I wouldn't say so because he's he's. He's not retarded in Black Christmas. <laughs> no, yeah. He's probably the he's, only person in this in, say, in Black Christmas the, that's not. He's, I say, he's the only one in Black Christmas that has his like thinking cap on here. Here he's just like your stereotypical like I don't have time for your womanly nonsense. <laughs> I'm trying to do men things, like solve crime and then be beaten to the punch every time. Yeah. So I mean again like I would say that's one of the downfalls of this film. As much as we both love John Saxon, I think you can kind of agree. It's definitely one of his least... It is one of his lesser performances, just because... I mean, like... I, I, mean, I, I, as, I, as, I definitely as, as, blame as, the, the the character itself in that we don't really get to see him that often. I wish no, I agree. he'd been I agree. around more. I agree. No, I definitely agree, especially with him getting top billing and, you know, the opening credits. Like, it's like, sorry, John Saxon. It's like, oh, great. John Saxon. And then, like... He's in it for 20 minutes. That's, you know. Can you imagine if this film revolved around John Saxon as the credits imply? Like, John Saxon in a bath with the, <laughs> with the Freddy Claw coming at him. <laughs> it would have been a great movie. Uh, no, it would have been great. Instant he like, classic. He, he would have been lighting up a Paul Mall 100 and be like, you can grab my balls, Freddy, but I'm going to take <laughs> Um, I'll take I'll take you somewhere where you don't want to go. The hurt train. Like, oh. <laughs> then you just see Freddie's hand like this. Like, oh, I'm in the wrong tub. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, so, like, like I said, I, I do think he does a very good job. But I, I, I do think it's one of his lesser performances just because he's, he's not, as you said, he's not there enough. And he is kind of a, a total aloof bastard throughout, like, you know, kind of. 
He doesn't like add it up at the end mm-hmm. because as we see at the end, it's all you know, it's all a dream. But yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think about uh, Glenn's death? Because I, I really like that scene where uh, Lieutenant Thompson comes into the house and they just see like the the dripping from the the ceiling. They're like they're like I don't, know, I don't know what the hell happened. You see your guy sitting there with a fucking bucket like catching the blood. <laughs> I and I love too when the paramedics come out. They've got the stretcher, and they're like, you don't need a stretcher. You need a mop. <laughs> it's great. It's so, so in, like, it's, it's so insensitive when they get there, but it's awesome. It's a great line. I like that one. Um, it, no, it is, it is great. I do like that because, again, it's very – with the whole dream sequence, it's very imaginative. Mm-hmm. And it's, not, it's violent, but it's not violent because we don't get to see any violence that actually happens. We see Glenn get dragged into the bed. And a whole bunch of things get sucked in, and then all of a sudden, a fucking waterfall of blood starts pouring out. Yeah. So it's not, re- you know, it's not really violent. Yeah, it's just, yeah. You don't really oh, see all, anything. Yeah. It's all visual, and it's all again like that. This is where when I go back to what I said about the film to begin with, it's very nuanced because a lot of the things that happens are well thought out. They're nuanced, but they're incredibly subtle, and that's one of like this. Again, it's subtle. Even though you, it's hard to say a fountain of blood shooting out of a bed is subtle. <laughs> yeah, it's right. subtle in the in, in the fact that it's again leaving it up to your imagination because we don't see what Freddy did to cause this giant explosion of blood come out of the bed. We just see the aftermath. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think about Freddy in this movie, um, or should I say Fred, in terms of how he presents to the characters? Like, because he does have some. One-liners. He does still have like a jokey element to him. What do you think about that? And you know, especially comparing it to the later films in the series. It's definitely one of the standouts because it's definitely what makes you kind of connect to Freddy Krueger compared to like as Michael Myers, or Jason, or whatever, because they're just stoic figures of death that just keep marching on no matter what you throw at them. They're just gonna keep coming. <laughs> Though he's not that quippy, Robert England does do a very good job. He's very physical. His snickering throughout is very good. You know, he doesn't have anything like, you know, there's no one-liners really to be had in this film that you can kind of quote. But I think his jokiness and his kind of laugh and his bravado is great. It's part of the character. When he fucking shoulder tackles Nancy through the mirror, that's fucking awesome. I love that. Like, when he's, like, snickering and it just, he's like, she's like, Fred Krueger's not real. And he just fucking comes flying through like a linebacker, like he's LT, coming to sack a quarterback. That's fucking awesome. I love it. <laughs> he does a really good job. And I, you know, it's a great balance between, you know, being serious and jokiness. And I think... For the most part, you know, he is serious, but he does have those few moments of brevity that make you, like, you know, like, I, oh, yeah, you know. I kind of like it, too, because it's almost like, you know, there's, like, a dementedness to it. Like, he's enjoying this, and it kind of relates back to, you know, he's not just a stoic killer. Like, obviously, he was a, a serial killer that enjoyed what he was doing, and, and so he's still doing it after he's technically but, dead. And... In this film, it doesn't go over the top. It's more so just like this would be how a demented person would act when they were, you know, stalking their prey. Um, and here, he, England doesn't really go for his like particular freddiness that he gets in the later movies. He's fairly serious, and the physical element to him is often kept pretty dark. Like, if you rem- if you remember, like, some of the scenes where he's getting beat up in, like, the Home Alone elements that <laughs> that this film has. Oh, that's, where... like, like it was, that's a part that I kind of forget every yeah. now and then. And yeah. it's just kind of like, wow, like, it was, like, it was fucking... <laughs> like, yeah, like, she's setting, like, sledgehammer traps and stuff, and he gets hit, and he's like, oh! <laughs> You know, this is pre-Home Alone, but still... <laughs> Exploding light bulbs, you're thinking of, like, mm-hmm. uh, why am I drawing a blank on his goddamn name? Who wrote Home Alone? Um, you're, you're talking about, uh... John... What's his nuts? 
um, wow, we're both drawing a blank on this. John know, Hughes. Uh, yeah, John Hughes. Thank you. John like, Hughes. Do so you think John Hughes is watching this? He's like, taking notes like, oh, put a kid in this and this is going to be fucking gold. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know it's 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 hilarious, like uh, how it has those uh, those Home Alone elements to it that you know just missing the doodly doo yeah. John Williams score. But, but like I like during those scenes, like you kind of get like a darker Fred Krueger because he, you know, obviously even though he's, you know, technically whatever you want to call it, like dead, whatever he's back from the grave, whatever, um, he still f- feels pain, and there's a, a moment where he's kind of like at his end and he's like you you know like you're going to die like you're dead now so it's it's almost like you know he's back from the grave but he still maintains the same um the same way that he acted when he was alive and i think that changes as we get into like the later nightmare on elm streets where they really make him more and more hammy where you're not able to really take him seriously as a real person like he used to be a real person he's now like a caricature of a person um in this film i think we do still get to see like oh yeah this was who he once was and now it's kind of like crossed over and now he's got a supernatural element to him for some reason somehow you know being murdered brought him back from the dead um i think i think this one you know is really where we see fred krueger as a like a somewhat realistic person and I, I like that about that. And, and it also differs from all, all the other slashers, which, you know, really don't give their characters much of a, a character whatsoever. They're just like a, a stand in for like a blank slate. Um, what do you think about the, the music, the score in this one? It's pretty good. It's consistent throughout, ever present, but it's got like a nice little synth track, you know, early 80s and new wave going on. Uh, no complaints whatsoever. I, I like it. Nothing like, speci- no, like, you know, tunes really specifically stick out, but it's not galling or anything. Yeah, it's got, it's got like a, like a, almost like a techno synth track to it. It's like, you know, it's kind of, uh, really bassy. Like, bling, bling, bling. um, I think it's, it, it works well, but uh, there's a reason probably why people don't recognize this one as much as the other. Uh, big slasher scores. Um, it doesn't have a big theme to it, like you know, like yeah. you know, Halloween. You know, yeah, you know. and it and it uses it fairly sporadically too. It's not like you know, you're constantly getting bombarded with the soundtrack. It's it's kind of a sporadic, mom, uh, momentary thing that it, it uses. Um, how about the ending? Like, wh- what do you interpret for the ending? For me, it's all a dream. At the end of it, like I, th- I feel like everything that we've seen, you could be take as a dream, because we see Nancy bouncing in and out, in and out, in and out, and then we see the end. We're like, oh, she won, and then like obviously she didn't, because you see it's all like a Pleasantville ending. Like, oh, everyone's smiling, and the, everything's pretty, and the colors are bright and beautiful, and you, everyone's back alive, and you know we can just sit here and. Oh no, Freddy's attacking us. We're in Christine, and all of a sudden the top comes down, and it's Freddy's colors, and then her mom gets dragged through the door. It's really cool and awesome. I do like that. Um, I've always I got- loved her getting dragged through the door because it's, it's it's really cool, very fast, and hilarious because it, it's it's clearly like a blow up doll or something that's it's getting stop dragged. Stop motion, like, yeah. you know, like stop motion. <laughs> but, I, but I've always loved it because it is a really great scene. Tammy, like, like you know. And it, it does harken back to, like, Friday 13th as well, like, that jump scare element to it at the end. It's like, you think everything's fine, mm-hmm. and then, boom. But, I mean, obviously, if you're watching, you should realize, like, no, all of a sudden, they just wake up, and, like, everything that she asked for is back to normal. It's, you know, it's kind of like yeah. Krampus, too. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> l- later on with Krampus, like, oh, I just want everything to be the same again. Well, fuck you. It can't be, and it's not. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I do like the ending. It's really cool because it's it is a downer note. Uh, you definitely, like I said, I definitely get the vibe kind of that you could take kind of what you saw is in its entirety a dream, which is cool because it adds another layer to the film, another uh, nice little meta contextual depth to it. Mm-hmm. Like, 
is everything we saw like what's real and what's a dream you know that's great um I do the one campy part I don't like is at the end when she's just like I realized Freddy you're nothing and if I don't believe in you like Santa Claus then you're nothing and then he you know turns into dust but I think that's again that's made up for though because at the end like after that it's like it's a brand new day. Wait, there's a fog ever present in California. What's <laughs> this? You know. Uh, I do like, like I said, I do like it quite a bit. I think it's well done. Uh, <clears throat> it's really good. I like it a lot. Yeah, I, th- I I like it. I think that it's fun that it's kind of all of a dr- been a dream in, inside of a dream. And you get this like really like almost leave it to beaver-esque <laughs> ending. ending it's like, like you know what i just decided i don't want to drink anymore so my alcoholism is done you know <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the few parts we haven't talked about yet what do you think if like uh halfway through the film she's uh, her been mom pulling be- out like triple sec to drink big bottles of vodka and just fucking pounding them and kind of comes out of nowhere it, but i guess I say, that is great at the end because she's like no i gave it up i feel fine <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, it kind of comes out of nowhere, but, you know, like, there's no indication of that early on, but I guess, you know, with, with alcoholics, that can happen, you know, you just have a, a, a a specific trauma that brings it out all back, but, um, oh, and when John Saxon's your husband, he's too busy with, I would say so, right? With, with too busy with work to come home. What do you, what else are you going to do? Plow you, you got, you're probably like, I I need some alcohol to get Well, when this. John Saxon is constantly like, oh, you know what? You just do your woman duties, and I'm going to do the real stuff. You know? The man stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's pretty much the only thing you can do is take up drinking. So <laughs> I don't blame her. Yeah, I don't know what kind of vodka they had. It def- definitely did not look like any vodka that I know of. But it almost looked like, like a Malibu sort of thing. Like, you know, I, I, was say, I think it was like a rum bottle or something. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it was definitely clear because when she smashes it, you know, when <laughs> I want to point this out, though, one of the things I find really funny is when um, Nancy's supposed to be going to sleep. Her mom comes in. She's like, oh, I'm so glad you're going to sleep. She takes away the cups and the, the coffee pot from the TV. And then she goes away. Nancy gets up. She pulls out another coffee pot from underneath the bed. <laughs> it's like such a fire hazard. Seriously. That's don't do that. I know, people. I know. Don't I do that. Don't put a coffee pot. Don't put a put a uh you know a, a running coffee pot under your bed especially one of those because they don't have automatic shutoffs in the 80s like that don't put it under your bed seriously no you're, no, you're totally right having like a fucking y- you're gonna end up on your factor bed- fiction i say having a coffee pot in your fucking bedroom in the 80s like <laughs> joe rogan's gonna be examining thank you fiction that's exactly it's like it's spontaneous combustion real like no it's actually she put a coffee pot underneath her bed the whole thing caught fire. <laughs> um, you're gonna have. You're gonna say you're gonna have fucking uh, Jonathan Frakes rolling in. The like, I know. Is it okay to make <laughs> coffee in the middle of the night? When you're- <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. The other thing well, that I love about '80s <laughs> movies and like TV shows is that in these shows, everybody could afford a second line for their bedroom. For their yeah, phone. like, what the hell? She's getting her own phone calls in her bedroom. I remember, too, because I remember I used to watch Clarissa Explains It All a lot, and she had a, a, a phone in her bedroom. She would get her own phone calls. I used to ask my parents all the time. I was like, can I get a phone in my bedroom? Can I, like, with my own phone number? And they're like, fuck, no. No, you cannot get that. That's expensive. Are you kidding me? You're going to get your own phone line? Absolutely not. And I, not like I, that. You're gonna. Can you get some uh, some cute boy to come up to your room and <laughs> on a ladder? And every time he came Lattice up, you work hear, on the uh, on the second floor. Every time he comes up, you hear, "Hey Sam." <laughs> <laughs> I just love like because in, in, in this movie too, like everybody's got a second line in their bedroom, like taking phone calls. Like I feel like when I was a kid, I had this. Did you really? Well, you were yeah. a lucky one then. I think I had my own phone. Wow, you had your own phone line in the bedroom. Good for you. Uh, that was not me. My parents were like, "No, you don't. You don't need another phone." I, I can't remember if I like carried the phone to my bedroom or if I had a phone. I can't remember. So don't quote me. I can't remember. Uh-huh. But I remember vividly talking with friends on the phone in my bedroom, though. 
at the old at my old house, dude, not my the one where I mainly grew up at. All right, so let's rate Nightmare on Elm Street. No, I, what? What? You're not ready to do that yet? What do you? No, got? no, you, you got you, left. You, you no, got you left? fuck, you fucked it up. You called it a nightmare. On, you called it nightmare on Elm Street. I, th- I said a nightmare on Elm Street. No, you, you did not. It. All right, no. let's rate a nightmare on Elm Street. Thank you. If you listen, you can't sneak it in there, okay? Your article has to be enunciated so you know that you're saying like a nightmare on Elm Street. Like, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I will get uh, Sir Michael Caine in here to read that. Oh, please do. Can, can we get Michael Caine? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he he's kind of like... Uh, on Elm Street. I was going to say, he's like Patrick Stewart and like Sir Ian McKellen, too. A little yeah. All sirs. But like, they're just doing it for the fun now, so you probably could get a hold of him. Like, Sir Michael Caine, can you be like, why do we fall so we can get back up and pick each other up? <laughs> why do we fall, Master Bruce? But go right. on. So what, what what would you give A Nightmare on Elm Street out of 10 speed pill bottles that uh, Heather's No dose from the 80s. Yeah, I mean speed. She's taking speed. She's, drugs, she's so. taking speed, yes. She's just, she's somehow legally <laughs> been getting speed. It's it's the Reagan era. There's no there's no Excuse me. There's no Censorship on that and That's right. restrictions. Just you go to the counter like I need speed and like That's okay. shit for you. <laughs> um, I was gonna go with uh ten um Heather Langenkamp booby doubles, but that's a good one too. We, we didn't get to see any boobies. You do when she goes underwater and those are not hers. So, well, I mean, like they tease it throughout the film too, like with like her wear and yeah, yeah like she, there's that one scene like, where she like, takes off her like uh, pajama top. And just from I'm, behind, you just see the bare back. Well, I'm not saying, like, the, I'm just saying, like, they're, like, a well-kept secret. You can tell by the sweater well, she wears. She's wearing that, like, business casual. No, so. that's what I'm saying. Like, you, you, I was saying, like, you can tell by wearing them, like, like ooh, there's something b- back behind there. But, like, she's wearing, like, you know, the the biggest of sweaters. Hence why Glenn is in such a rush to get underneath there. Like, He's been I'm, sticking around. Yeah. Um, I would give Nightmare on Elm Street a uh, an eight point five. Yeah. I, yeah, I think it's a really good movie. Um, I think that you know it it is of a time from the slasher genre where it is a little bit slow, even for like its ninety minute runtime. It does kind of take its time to get get to where it's going. But I think Wes Craven does a really good job with the creativity, the kills. Um, the idea of a dreamscape and what he brought to the the formula uh, of the slasher, and I think that Fred Krueger here does feel like a more formidable and um, menacing killer than what he will eventually become in the the later sequels, and I think that we we get to see some really cool elements to. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street that I I wish that they probably had gone through a little bit better. Like I, I think that there was a lot of opportunity for dreamlike elements in the series, and they don't really make a lot of um, um, emphasis to that in the later sequels. I think here we really get a lot of interesting elements, suspenseful elements, uh, a lot of tension, and Wes Craven really does a good job here directing and um, bringing to life a very unique character. Uh, in Freddy Krueger, um, like I said, you know it's it can be a little bit slow, um, but I think overall, if you get through that, I, I really do think like even contemporary audiences will see the appeal in A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, which you know is a very good thing for the slasher genre because it has like you know the big three that really kind of perpetuate the the slasher element, um, even for people that are coming to it new so very good uh very good movie from west craven revitalizing the slasher genre in the 80s wow way to steal my thunder i'll <laughs> give it an eight and a half out of ten as well um it's definitely a film that stands the test of time i think west is incredibly creative with the violence in this film it's very it's definitely nuanced 
there's not a lot of over the top gore. The dream sequence allows a lot to happen. I think probably in the film there's only like three or four deaths. I think, as you said, the dream sequence does allow a lot to be done and a lot of room to play. It'd be interesting to see what they do down the line. I think Robert England does a great job as Freddy. Uh, though he's not the ham equippy guy that we get to know later on, I think he's menacing enough and definitely has enough intriguing, you know, little snappy lines to give him the character that we know today. Uh, I think everybody in the film does a well, really good job, you know, acting. Obviously, you know, John Saxon's great, Heather Lane Camp's great, Johnny Depp's great. Premise is really cool. Um, as you said, for a 90 minute film, it does kind of drag in parts, which is kind of surprising. Um, but I do think the parts where you get to see kind of Wes's creativity and the direction that he's going and some of the things that we get to see, like the whole school sequence of the dream, is really well done and really great between seeing Tina's body get dragged throughout the hall and then like Freddy transforming. It's all really well done. It's really good. Eight and a half out of ten. This is a great film. There's a reason why it's become part of the cultural zeitgeist, part of Americana, part of horror films in general. Uh, so it's definitely something to watch because it's it's not like your other hor- horror slasher films. West gives a attention to detail that a lot of them miss and gives a lot of creativity to it that a lot of them miss as well. Mm-hmm. So, eight and a half as well. Yeah. You weren't going to hear anything groundbreaking from us on this. It's, sure, you know, no. It's like when we did like when we did Halloween. Like he's like what, what the fuck do you want us to say about <laughs> that? <It's been> <laughs> right. <laughs> but we had fun with it just the same. It's on HBO Max, too, if you uh, need to check it out. Um, All of them are. Y- yeah. The one thing that I will say, th- this film is desperately in need of a 4K release, though. Um, the one that is on HBO Max, it, the dark like, scenes are, like, extremely dark, contrasty. It needs a 4K of, to really... Even, I don't even think it has a 1080p release. That's like 720p yeah. when I'm watching it. Yeah, re- it definitely, desperately. Need- I've been waiting for it. You know, I just sold my DVD uh, box set. And I've been waiting for a 4K release because I don't really want to, you know, double dip on anything. So, um, please, please, you know, give us a, a box set of this for, on 4K. That would be They're really too great. busy re- releasing Halloween H2O and Resurrection. I know. I've got that this. ordered as well. Well, way to go. Fucking <laughs> Redman gets another day in the sun or whatever it is. Is it Redman? I can't remember. Yeah. Tyra. I don't know Tyrus in Resurrection. Well, hopefully they'll give A Nightmare on Elm Street some love some some uh, pretty soon with a 4K. Give, give a fucking full release of the series so Dan Doc can get, can get his goddamn money for Dream Warriors, okay? <laughs> That's one of the few things I've learned as the older I get in life. I've known more Dockin songs than I've ever realized I've ever known. Wow. Yeah, I don't know too many. I definitely... The Dream Warrior, the Dream Warrior song, yeah, definitely. No, I, I you know, Unchain the Night too, but, but I mean, there's like a whole bunch. Like I, I've heard at work from a buddy who's a seen Dokken live at the Scad Coke Fair. Uh, just like after listening to it, like, wow, I knew more Dokken songs than I ever realized. That I thought I knew. I, th- you know, yeah. D level Metallica. <laughs> Um, all right, so what are we doing? Uh, we're doing next week. We're doing a Cronenberg Cron- next week. So what are we doing? Um, well, if we go by my graphic that I made, uh, you know, which I kind of just came up with on the fly. I didn't really consult you or anything like that. No, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of, kind of put Jeez. it together, and that was that was that. Um, I believe it is Rabid. I think that I that I did. Um, oh, I was gonna say. I was gonna say video draw. No, it's definitely not Video Drum. Uh, Video Drum is later on. Um, I think it's Rabbit. Um, if you have ever seen Rabbit, no, 
No. Uh, the only Cronenberg films I've seen are The Naked Lunch and The Fly. Yeah, and I actually have not seen Rabbit either, um, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do it here. Um, it looks a lot like like Shivers, um, you know, kind of kind of a similar approach to that. But I'm really interested in in doing Rabbit um, because I do have it on Blu-ray and, and I actually never watched it. So um, I I believe that's the one that we're doing next. Um, if I look at my image. What are the, I was trying to go in order. Um, yeah, yep, Rabbit is next. Yep. So I think we'll do Rabbit next. I think that's a good pick. Um, so we're on to some Cronenberg. I'm excited. I am not super, like, hugely well-versed in Cronenberg. I've seen some of his movies. I wouldn't say that I've seen a majority of his movies. So we should have a good time with, with uh, and what I, have you, I, what have you seen so far? Um, I have seen Videodrome scanners. Um, what else? The, see the dead zone, the fly, the dead zone. Um, is that about it? That's probably, you know, I, I think I've seen a few, a couple others that I'm not remembering right now, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely interested in checking. Oh, Shivers! I've seen obviously seen Shivers, um, but I I am definitely checking. We're I think it it's going to be fun to check out Rabbit and and uh, some of the other movies that we've picked for the for the show. So should have a good time. I forgot that he did the Dead Zone. Dead Zone's a really good film, actually. Watched it recently, the other you know like maybe like a few months ago, and was really surprised with how good of a film it is. Um, Martin Sheen, awesome in that movie. Love him. Everyone loves Martin Sheen. All right, so um, what? When are we gonna uh, say? When are we gonna review the USA Network TV show? That's all. <laughs> yeah, right. The the whole show. Only well, it didn't last that long. Probably like three seasons or so, something like that. I imagine. It's kind of a it's kind of a hard concept to just keep, continue doing like season after season. Not really like a one of those sh- things that you can do like wow six seasons six Plus, seasons huh six seasons it definitely of, se- it's of Anthony definitely Michael Hall like it kind of it seems like it would be hard to continue that but I guess you know if they just did like cases of the week where he's like oh, I see things you know I guess he could they could do get away with it but it just seems like it would be hard to continually come up with concepts for that Listen, so. USA and Anthony Michael Hall need the money I'll have to go go back and watch that I haven't uh, I, I don't think I ever really even watched any of it check it out you're too busy watching Monk during that time period. that's actually probably true yeah <laughs> 81 episodes it ran for. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right about that. <laughs> yeah. I was watching the other top USA show. Monk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, which, speaking of, watch our Mangler episode. That's right. Because as you say, it's got a connection to Monk. I've never. Oh, it sure does. <laughs> and actually, oh no, you know what? We didn't. Uh, we didn't. We're not doing that for the West Craven stuff. But the Hills Have Eyes also has the same connection. Oh. Yeah, but you didn't know that. No, I did not. Um, M- Monk connection? Not. Uh, not the the old one. Not the actual West Craven one, but the remake. Um, actually has um, Ted Levine in it as well. Oh, Ted Levine. Fuck! Yep. So. Fuck! Shit! That's right. Rest in peace, Toby Hooper. <laughs> All right. So, actually, you know what? Um, I'm... Let's, let's let's end it there. I think, I think that's, 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 that's good for our West Craven intro i think everybody got a really good look at what's to come for our halloween episodes i think 
people should be excited for our Cronenberg episode. And if you are excited and you want to check out the rest of Craven some Cronenberg, you can subscribe to us on pretty much any podcasting app that you can think of. We're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, home base at anchor.fm, um, pretty much everything. So if you have a podcast app, subscribe to us, leave us a nice review. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for us on there, Blood and Black Rum Podcast. Uh, we have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash blood and black rum podcast where you can donate to us, put that back towards beer. We appreciate anything that you can give our way. And you can write to us at blood and black rum podcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, um, any movies that you want to hear us cover on the next shows. And we'll take that into consideration. So thanks for listening. We hope you uh, enjoy our Halloween season that we're going to be doing all uh, September and October long. Uh, tune in next time for a Cronenberg movie as we do rabbit until then take care